Welcome to Total Wellness. I'm your host, Dr. Dennis Armagan, and I am a performance specialist. What does that mean? We'll get into it. Today is part one in this new series on various types of pain throughout the body, and today we're going to focus on back pain. Here's a stat, folks. As we age over 30 years old, seven to 10 out of 10 people suffer from back and spinal conditions. Holy mackerel, that's tremendous. You know, I always use the analogy of an automobile and how when it reaches a certain number of miles, things start to go. And if we go past that mark, more things start to go. Systemically, we're talking about the engine, transmission, air conditioning, And the computer system, which a lot of the new cars have now, it gets a virus just like our computers at home. So the same thing with the body. After age 30, the spine actually starts to change shape and also starts to have to break down, unfortunately. The good news is there's a lot that we can do. And you can look back on our previous shows speaking about seven steps to healthy aging a few shows ago, and you can definitely find us uh, on our channel. So getting back to it, what happens is with gravity and just activities of daily living that we do, bending forward, twisting in and out of the car, picking our kids up, up and down, whether we have a job where we're lifting things and then placing them on shelves and and things like this, uh, movers. I mean, we can go on and on. But here's something that you may or may not have known. True or false, sitting increases pressure on the lower back by over 100 times. I'll give you about three seconds to get this. Okay, most of you probably do know that the answer is true. And that the amount of pressure that occurs on our spine when we're sitting supersedes what happens when we're standing by that number over a hundred times. Isn't that amazing? It's almost the opposite of what we would think of. And especially with all of the changes with COVID and things of this nature where people are working remotely, wherever they're working, there's a large percentage of the population that are sitting as part of their jobs on a regular basis. And it isn't a coincidence that there is a significant increase in the amount of back problems, especially as we age, especially in that 40 to 70 age group. And there's no discrepancy in uh, whether it's male or female. Um, It just, it's a cumulative effect. And as I always share with you, I'm here to provide hope. So don't get too down on those stats. But let's go over a few common back conditions out there. And I was talking to a gentleman at the gym this morning, and he said he just had spinal fusion, and uh, he was probably in his mid-30s. And I was really sad to hear that because it definitely could have been avoided. But more than that, a lot of people share with me that a lot of doctors, surgeons, all types of healthcare professionals don't really explain the terminology. Um, So it's very easy to speak in medical terms, if that's how you've been trained. But how do we reach the masses? How do we reach everyone out there like you and me and your friend and your neighbor? So this is how we're going to do it. I like to break things down. That's my uh, science computer brain, the uh, cyborg that my friends call me. And let's put it in plain English. So let's go over some common back issues. I don't really like to call them disorders because a lot of times it, it can be fixed and uh, change. So number one on the list, how many of you out there have heard of a disc herniation or herniated disc? Okay, most of us out there have probably heard that before, but what does that really mean? Well, it sounds very specific, but in fact, it's actually a general term, and I will compare that to the word arthritis, which can mean one joint or multiple joints that are inflamed that cause discomfort and dysfunction. But let's get back to this. So herniated disc, what is a disc? Well, inside our spine are these amazing bones that can handle quite a bit of pressure. And in between the bones is this, 
I call it a water balloon type substance where it resembles probably the shape of a bagel or a donut. And it has this fluid inside that is used as a shock absorber to protect us. So that's great news. Uh, if we were to measure our height, here's another crazy fact. At the beginning of the day to the end of the day, because of the effects of gravity, we'd actually be shorter, sometimes a half an inch shorter. Anyway, there's a bit of information you could use for Jeopardy sometime or one of the games you play with to impress one of your friends. Okay, so let's get back to it. So the discs are made to protect us, to absorb, absorb different types of pressure, different types, especially from gravity itself, and of course, to protect us. Now, the thing about it structurally is that in between the bones of the back and the discs, the spongy water balloon substances are these nerve roots and they are tiny little, protrude, they protrude outwards, almost like a diagonal. Um, and actually, it's in the direction sideways and backwards. That's kind of, so it is a di diagonal to the front of us. And what happens is when there's abnormal pressure on those discs, it squeezes that water balloon substance, that gel-like substance, and presses on those nerve roots. The problem with that is those nerve roots then are connected to the actual nerves that control the area that we're speaking about. So in this case, we're going to talk about if you can visualize pretty much from the lower back down to the legs. So the nerves that come out of the lower back supply control, motor control, function, circulation, feeling for the legs. And most people that have various types of back conditions, uh, if you watch them walk, you'll see some things that are dysfunctional, that are not healthy, they compensate, right? We see this all the time, people limp. So that's a clear indicator that high probability that there's some involvement in the spine. So getting back to this, when you, when you put pressure on the nerve roots, it starts to disrupt the normal flow of information that goes from the nerves to the outside of the body, the muscles, all of these things, sensation. And what happens is we get a sharp, now here's the cool thing, folks. Here's, I call this differential diagnosis. You don't have to memorize this, but it's good to know. So research has shown that when there is a sharp burning type of pain that also shoots, radiates, high probability there is nerve involvement. So that's what we're talking about here with a herniated disc is that there is limited space already to start out with. Now, the way God made us is it's perfect, right? All the space is where it should be. However, when we start messing up <laughs> or we start breaking down like a car, that space gets compromised. And we use the word compression. Well, that's not a good thing here. And so what happens is when we start squeezing on those little nerve roots, right? So if you can imagine the water balloon starts pressing on that nerve root, and then the nerve root starts sending signals to the actual nerve and says, oh, we got a problem here. And so that transference of information about what's going on is now amplified. And I just want to say that when we get to this point where their pain is present, an orthopedic or anatomical or a kinesiology-based approach is not really effective because the way things work in our brain, and I didn't make this up, this is the way it is, it is a hierarchy. What does that mean? It's similar to when we Google. If we Google something, right, we have the first page, second page, third page, everything is in a sequence, and usually for most of us, we look at the first page and maybe the top three entries. Same type of deal in the brain. Pain overrides the ability for a muscle to contract. It's not even close, folks. You know, it's number one versus, let's just say, hypothetically, number 10 on the list. You can't do both at the same time either. So the approach then needs to be from a neurophysiological level, not a anatomical and kinesiology-based level. So I'll leave it at that. I'm not here to really discuss... Uh, protocols right now that could be for another time 
But let's get back to it. So that's really what a herniated disc is. And there are different levels, folks. So that's why I said it was a, a general term that you, they can rate, you can rate it in several steps. But again, I'm not going to bore you with all that. There's a spectrum, just like there's a spectrum, you know, with, with autism, with diabetes, with all of these systemic type condition, multiple sclerosis, there's a spectrum there. Same thing with a herniated disc. And you know, here's the deal. It may not be just one thing. It may not be one area. It may not be an L4. Maybe it's L2, L3, L4. Well, then we have an issue there. And that actually, the nerve that supplies comes from L2 to L4 is the front of the leg called the femoral nerve that most people don't talk about. Here's the star of the show, though. The sciatic nerve that most people have heard about and the general term that some doctors and healthcare professionals give to people is sciatica. Again, it is a general term. Is it right? Is it left? Is it multiple levels? How bad is it? Does, is it just in one area or does it go down? Now, the sciatic nerve, folks, if you can envision, goes from our lower back through our hip musculature, all those gluteal powerful muscles. It's in, inside of that, down the back of our legs, you know, our hamstring muscles. And when it gets to the outside of the knee, it actually splits off into two other nerves that supply the front part of the shin and ankle and, of course, the calf and the back of the ankle. We're not going to really focus on that. But many times, folks, with a herniated disc, you'll have radiation of pain that goes all the way down the back of the leg. That's very common. And unfortunately, ladies, that um, when they go through pregnancy, uh, this is, sciatica is highly, highly, highly common. And uh, not that they're not dealing with 5 million other things. Uh, it's amazing. The, the, just the natural uh, occurrence of pregnancy and the amazing um, way that God has created women to truly handle all of these changes and create life. Just phenomenal. So um, props out to all the moms out there. Okay, next on the list, we're going to talk about spinal stenosis. What the heck does that mean? Well, let's do a little anatom anatomy here. Uh, so in between all of the vertebrae in our back, if we look straight down, there's a canal. And that canal holds the spinal cord, which is essential for life and all movement and this transference of information. And I'm sure most of you have heard out there, like when someone has a bad car accident or motorcycle accident, you know, and they call it a quadriplegic, they're literally paralyzed from, from the neck down. So something very serious where we need our spinal cord to be intact and the, that canal needs to have, again, the perfect amount of space, which we were created that way, but as we age, some things happen. So what happens, stenosis is a narrowing of that canal. So if you can imagine a straw, and you start to uh, kink the straw, how is the flow of fluid going to be? It's not going to be that good. Well, the same thing happens uh, with our nervous system that we always talk about, that central nervous system, that we need the nerves to then move to uh, tell us, uh, help us with balance coordination, to fire certain muscles, to cert turn others, other muscles off. Anyway, so if we have a narrowing in that canal, that's a big problem. So I truly feel, and again, there's varying levels of stenosis, but some of the common things that we see is because of that squeezing of the canal, shutting off the activation of the nervous system that supplies our legs, people literally drop out of midair, and it's not their fault. And the main thing that occurs at is when they're standing up straight or they lean backwards, and then also backwards with a twist. All three of those movements are the mechanisms that can lead to the shutting off because of the spinal stenosis of the transfer of information of those nerves. And just getting back to the herniated disc, so with the herniated disc, some of the main things that the mechanisms that cause that is excessive sitting for long periods of time. That forward flex posture and also with a twisting that is the mechanism that will that can contribute to tremendous pain and discomfort. That was for the herniated disc. So now we have the opposite. Now we have going the other way 
So standing for prolonged periods of time is a number one symptom and usually five to 10 minutes for the average person. Again, that's going to vary, but I'm giving you some gener general, ooh, general information here. I don't know what happened there. I had two words come out at once. Anyway, following up, you got to stay with the show. Let's go. So in either case, there's going to be a similar type of uh, protocol to get someone to another level. And although it's a different mechanism, um, this protocol that I was talking about, this neurophysiology or neurodevelopmental type of approach where it affects multiple systems versus an individual muscle, which is what a lot is out there, unfortunately. And, um, but things are changing, you know? That's the good news. The new paradigm is to take the approach that affects multiple systems and, of course, research, and it's evidence-based, and it backs it up. And I have to tell you, folks, I'm a prime example of this. I truly had multiple dysfunctional diagnoses in my spine. It was a cumulative uh, effect of being a pro hockey player and also lift lifting like uh, a maniac for many, many years. And, you know, when you're inherently strong, of course, then the male ego kicks in <laughs> and you start bragging about what you can do and all the attention you get and you start compromising on form, which I was guilty of, and it became more ego driven. And so my back went, oh, yeah, we're going to show you. And in 2011, um, I was partially paralyzed. So it was very difficult to walk. Um, I made me walk a few tiny steps. My whole back would go into spasm. Uh, it was really bad. Uh, there was almost nothing that I could do. Uh, could not sleep for about two months. And I met someone, uh, one of my colleagues, who um, phenomenal, phenomenal neurologist. And she said, you got to change what you're doing. And I was the guinea pig. And I created a system. So here's the good news, folks. I have zero symptoms. Zero back pain zero limitations and guess what no surgery so that is not the norm it is an anomaly but here's a cool thing folks it's not hocus pocus and i can back up all the scientific principles and here's a great thing i've been able to replicate the results that i got from me for several hundred people that have been suffering for years and years and years and i thank god every day and uh, it's just a privilege so getting, getting back to this, so we have herniated disc or disc herniation, we have spinal stenosis, and what's the common factor there? Well, how did we get to that point, A, and that's a primary diagnosis, folks. Unfortunately, in the medical field, that's how insurance works, where there needs to be a primary diagnosis. It doesn't mean there aren't any di other diagnoses there. That's the crazy thing. So... With the spine, from my 35 years in the medical and health field, looking at thousands of MRIs and x-rays and things of this nature and reports, it is never one diagnosis when it comes to the spine. So you might say, all right, Dr. Dennis, what else is there? Here we go. I call it a coupling. So what I mean is, let's say you are diagnosed with a herniated disc or spinal stenosis. Here's the other things that there's a high probability you would see. Degeneration of the vertebrae, potential uh, fractures in the wings of the vertebrae, the outer parts of the vertebrae that are responsible for stability. Uh, you may also have various forms of nerve compression, uh, sciatica. I mean, we can go on and on. We're talking four to five different diagnoses that what came first, right? The chicken or the egg? Well, we don't know that. That's why we have to do an extensive uh, history taking to determine this. And that is the key, folks, is we got to find out how did we get here versus putting a Band-Aid on something. Here's, here's some pain meds. Uh, here's a surgery. Here's a cortico uh, steroid injection. It's up to you folks. You know, it's do you want permanent transformation 
or do you want to just feel a little better now and then with the potential for it to come back? It's up to you. All right, third common spinal condition that I'd like to talk about is basic arthritis. And there are so many uh, variations of this. There are medical terms that we don't really need to get into. The bottom line is this. When you experience any type of arthritis, but we're talking about the spine here, here's, here's what the common symptoms are when, uh, when you ex uh, experience this. Okay, first thing in the morning, very stiff, um, maybe even like a dull aching sensation in, in various areas. Here's a great thing. As you move, though, as the day goes on, here's where patients have reported that start to feel better. And as the day goes on even more, almost to the point sometimes where they have no pain or discomfort and they're moving pretty good. And then, unfortunately, as the day winds down, it's we're back to where we started from in the morning. And that's very common. Um, also, it seems that from the research that when you have arthritic conditions, that heat does very well. Whereas a lot of times when you have... Um, neurological conditions, cold may or may not help with that. But getting back to the arthritic conditions, that moving is increasing your core temperature, your body temperature. So that makes sense that if something's kind of stiff and dull, you know, uh, we can get things going pretty easily. So that's good news, folks. And again, how did we get to this state of arthritis? And let me just say, so some of the underlying conditions of arthritis is with the vertebrae, you get these bony growths sometimes. And sometimes those bony growths get in the way of the vertebrae to, <laughs> to rotate, which is what we need when we walk, when we move. We can't walk around all stiff, you know, like a soldier, because honestly... Uh, the requirement to be able to walk is rotation, is turning of the spine. So that's what happens is we have this called a shearing effect. So it micro tears that start to occur. And then what happens is we start compensating on other areas where maybe are not so stiff, but then all the stresses go to those areas. So it's very common that someone that has various types of uh, spinal arthritis Will, will definitely show tightness in the hips, the legs, uh, the ankles, and then actually going up the other way, uh, neck and middle back, because it, it takes the brunt of all the pressure of the area that's not moving, and that's just common. That's how we are as, as humans. So in all these cases, just to – I want to make this point is that, again, there is a primary diagnosis, but especially with the spine, there are multiple diagnoses that couple with it because the spine is so complex, and for it to function optimally, we need all of the systems, all of the surrounding, not just structures, but internally working as a team, this synergistic effect to not just protect us, but for the long haul, for us to participate in the things that we like to do, different activities, different sports, and even going to the gym, whereas we're going to get back to in all these three conditions, so herniated disc, spinal stenosis, and spinal arthritis, um, there is going to be a need to increase flexibility. Now, again, what I'm sharing with you, this is general information. You need to speak to your healthcare professional, your doctor, about creating a customized program. And I'm going to stress that, folks, because let's just say my friend Joey, you know, has a herniated disc at L4 and he's 50 pounds overweight and he hasn't, you know, gone to the gym in five years. And then you have Sally who's in, who's a collegiate athlete that has the same diagnosis, but will have different symptoms. So you know what I mean? It needs to be very customized and I'm sorry, folks, just be careful what you're looking. When you Google something, <laughs> the accuracy of the information is very debatable. And I always say, please look at your source. Um, you know, there are many sources out there that are credible, and then there are even more that are not. And I always say this, folks, everyone has an opinion. So my question is, and how accurate is that? Does a mechanic 
does the car mechanic actually know how to be a carpenter? Mm, maybe, maybe not, and vice versa. Uh, does someone who drives cars for a living know how to put one together? You got to think about it, okay? We can be familiar with ideas, but it doesn't mean we, we have mastered something or we have the knowledge to then take care of it for ourselves or then take care of it for someone else. So we need to stay in our lane. That's what I say. It's always good to learn. I love learning. It is actually imperative to have a per permanent transformation in your life. And, you know, I, I thought it was important to bring up the spine here because such a so many millions of people are really suffering. And I hate to say it, folks, but the truth, and again, I'm coming to you as a holistic doctor with a lot of experience and results that people don't get, is surgery should be a last option. You should have, if, if someone I knew was going to get surgery, I'd say get at least three opinions, three professional opinions, and see where you're at. Because here's the problem with the spine too, folks. You can get that surgery. You can get something called a fusion that's going to literally melt the two bones together. But here's the problem. If you need, if we need rotation turning to move, then what happens if it's smushed together and then cemented in there? So what's going to happen over time? You may, that may take care of the instability temporarily. But what is it going to lead to down the road, folks, and that's what I'm trying to say, is that we need to look at the big picture, right? Our lives, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. So we need to look at the long haul and what can help us in the near future. And, you know, this whole thing with the spine, I, I, that's my whole, my whole goal for this show today is to share that it is super complex. Therefore, the... Uh, type of evaluation, all of these types of things that need to be done have to be customized for you to definitely get what you want and move forward in your life. And see, folks, once I explained some of this terminology, it's not as scary, right? Um, it, it makes a lot of sense. You know, it comes down to space. You know, the way we are have been designed. We are perfectly engineered. Unfortunately, we are not perfect. We should get rid of that in the dictionary because it doesn't mean anything, right? If God is perfect and we're not, right? So, but the key is we have to address multiple systems when it comes to the spine. Circulation system, even our respiratory system. Because here's the other thing that I, that I didn't even share and I'm going to bring it in real quick. Do you know one of the other uh, mechanisms, one of the key uh, factors that lead to spinal dysfunction like we talked about? We didn't even talk about the alignment. Do you know how many people have curved spines? They call that scoliosis. Super common. And I was reading another article recently, research article, that it's actually now starting to increase in young boys, like middle-aged boys, for many years, it was mid, um, not middle aged, <laughs> middle school, middle school aged. It was girls first. Now the incidence in boys is starting to increase. So what is causing that? There's many, many factors that we can speak about. Could it be to all this gaming where you're sitting for hours and hours and hours versus when we were young, we were said we were told, go outside, go play. So we did. We played hockey. So, you know. Get off your butt and move. That's how you're going to help to prevent having back issues. This is Dr. Dennis. It's been a pleasure seeing you all today. And as always, I'm here to provide hope, support, inspiration, and specialized knowledge so that you can optimize your level of performance in your lives. God bless. Take care.